Well, good morning, church. We are so thankful that you are joining us this morning for our pre-recorded online service. Now, usually this is premiering on YouTube at 10 o'clock on Sundays, and then we feature it throughout our Facebook page and on our, uh, our church website as well. Hey, I want to encourage and invite you that uh, weather allowing and, and with the current situation of our state and doing our best to follow the guideline that's put forth um, by our leadership, we are having outdoor services. They're here at the building Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. And if you haven't come to those, we really want to encourage and invite you to come and, and be a part of that. In the meantime, though, we're so glad that we have an opportunity for you to join us like this. Take a moment to like the video, share the video, uh, comment in the comment section below. Let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to hear from you. This morning, we're going to continue our series that we've been doing on the minor prophets. The minor prophets are the last 12 books in the Old Testament. We call them the minor prophets just because compared to the major prophets, they're much smaller in size. And today we are in the prophet Habakkuk. Now Habakkuk was a prophet who was prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah during the time just before the Babylonians were about to come in and take the southern kingdom into captivity. The northern kingdom has pretty much already been more or less wiped out because of the Assyrians who came in. The Babylonians came in behind the Assyrians, wiped out the Assyrians, and now they're the ones in control. And that's where we pick up with the book of Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk's name, I thought this was interesting. The Hebrew name Habakkuk literally means wrestler. So you have this guy whose name is wrestler. Isn't that a weird name? Uh, he's unique among the prophets because in most of the Old Testament prophets, what would happen is God would have a message that would come from God to the prophet. And then the prophet would take the message from God and present it to the people. Thus saith the Lord, the old King Jim Bible would say when you would have the prophet's word that would come from God to his people. But unlike the other minor prophets, Habakkuk is going to the Lord and he's talking about the people rather than God going to Habakkuk and talking, uh, giving him a message to share with the people. Habakkuk comes before God with this, this complaint. He, he starts off his book by asking the God, how long, O Lord? And Habakkuk is a great book. If you have ever if you have ever prayed a prayer to God and wonder if he heard, wonder if he would answer your prayer, man, Habakkuk is a book that you should read. Because he kicks off by, listen, this isn't on your screen, it's not on the outline, but Habakkuk verse, chapter 1, verse 2, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? So Habakkuk presents in chapter 1 and 2, he presents these two complaints before God. His first complaint is this. Habakkuk says, Lord, your people, your children, the chosen people of Israel, they are not living the way they say that they are believing. That what they are doing is not in line with what you have commanded us to do. So he's asking God, why, Lord, why do you allow your people to sin with, with just the, this, this blatant disrespect and disregard for God's word? Why do you allow people to treat each other unfairly? Why do you allow the idolatry? And why do you allow your people to spiritually commit adultery? You really need to do something about it. That's his first complaint. And when he makes the cry, how long, O Lord? Will you, before you answer, well, in Habakkuk, it's not very long. Because right after Habakkuk makes his first complaint, the Lord answers. And the Lord's answer is one when he says that I'm about to do something that if I explained it to you, you wouldn't even understand. But he does anyway, and he says, here's what I'm going to do, Habakkuk. I'm about to bring in the Babylonians, and they are going to discipline my people. Then my people are about to go into captivity. And that is how I will discipline them for their wickedness. Because any father who loves his children will discipline and correct them. And that's what God's about to do. But then Habakkuk has this second complaint in chapter 2. Habakkuk's second complaint is simply this. Lord, 
How can you use someone even more wicked than your children to correct your children for their wickedness? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you do something like that? And then Habakkuk, or rather God to Habakkuk, gives his next answer. And God explains to him that the Babylonians will be judged too. And it sets up this thing. And this is what's so, what's so amazing. Uh, as we've been studying uh, these minor prophets, you see time and time again how even though God might be specifically talking about his children Israel, even though he might be specifically talking about a nation like Assyria or a nation like Babylon, the application and the truth of the messages of the minor prophets are for God's children today. His church applies to nations today. And nations who just disrespect God and have no regard for God and his word, someday they will face judgment, just like the Babylonians did eventually face judgment. So Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk closes with this prayer. I mean, this wrestler becomes a worshiper. He, he goes from, from complaining to praising God for who and for what God is. And, and I love at the end of chapter 3. He finishes with these words. Habakkuk says, I rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He enables me to go on to the heights. And God's answers restores Habakkuk's faith in God's wisdom. It restores Habakkuk's faith in God's sovereignty. And it restores Habakkuk's faith in God's salvation. And that's the point of Habakkuk. The point of Habakkuk, the major message from this minor prophet is a message of faith. The essential aspects of how important faith is for the life of the believer. A faith of even when you can't see something in front of you, you have this trust in this God who is in control. A faith that even when it doesn't make sense, why God would you use this nation to correct your people who are more wicked than your people? It's this faith who trusts and has joy in God his Savior. And what I want to focus on today, I've entitled this lesson, uh, the idea that we live by faith. And I call it that because there's a very popular, very important verse in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. If you have your outline, it's, it's the first verse on the outline. It's, it's here on the screen. And here, Habakkuk, uh, God's response to Habakkuk's complaint. He says, the evil nation is very proud of itself. It is not living as it should, but those who are right with God will live by faith. Some translations will say the righteous will live by faith. Other translations say the just will live by faith. And this is a verse in Habakkuk that is so important. It is such an important Old Testament verse that in our New Testament, it is quoted no less than three different times. Now, I put all three of these on your outline. They're here on the screen. Uh, let me share them with you. There's two that come from Paul, and then there's one that comes from the writer of Hebrews, which I think was probably Paul, but we don't know for sure. But look at Romans 1, 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. Then in Galatians chapter 3 verse 11, Paul there writes, Clearly no one relies on the law. The law is justified, or excuse me, clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. And then finally in the book of Hebrews, the people God accepts will live because of their faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. So here you see how important this verse is, how central this is to the message of Habakkuk. And it's a message that is timeless 
for God's people. It applied to God's people at the time of Habakkuk, and here we are over 2,000 years later, and it's an essential message that applies to us. And I think the concept, the importance of you and I as children of God living by faith, being made righteous to be just through our faith is more essential now than ever in this crazy time that we currently find ourselves. So on your outline, real quickly, just a few minutes, let me share with you three aspects of this idea of living by faith. But because it's mentioned in Habakkuk three times in the New Testament, it's so essential. So number one, of course, the first blank is this. We are called to live by faith. We are called to live by faith. This is not something that God says is a, is a suggestion. It's not a good idea, but rather it's a command. It's an imperative. It is something that is essential in the life of the believer to say that the way that I live, the way that I act, the things that I do is done by faith. Living by faith was God's answer to Habakkuk's complaints to Habakkuk's struggle, to Habakkuk's questions, and it's still the answer for us today, no matter what we're facing. That, that when we don't understand situations, when we can't see the sense in something happening in our lives, in our world, that God says you still live by faith. So another New Testament passage, I, I, I mentioned 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 9 on your outline. In First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, rather, 4, 7, the Bible says that we live by faith and not by sight. Some translations of that say that we walk by faith. And, of course, the idea of a walk being a metaphor for how you live your life. See, the Apostle Paul reminds his readers that followers of Christ Someone who calls himself a Christ follower, they build their life around faith. They build their life around things that have eternal significance. Rather than wasting our time pursuing this, the, the things that the world pursues, as a Christian, we should focus on the unseen realities of Jesus, of God's word, of the heaven that is waiting for us. Walking by faith means that we are trusting God, that we're striving to see this, this world through the, through, through the lens of, of eternal consequences. Trying to see things the way God sees things. Trying to focus not on what is seen because that's temporary, but on what is unseen because that's eternal. It means that we, we are fearing God more than we fear anything any man could do to us. Amen? It means that we are more concerned with what God's Word says over anything that this world says. It means that we choose to live by what God has revealed to us rather than trying to, to trust our own understanding. Rather than saying, well, this doesn't make sense, or this doesn't make sense. But instead, we are living by this faith of God and His Word that He is controlled, that He is sovereign, that He is the one who brings us salvation, and that's what walking and living by faith is all about. Uh, Augustine once wrote, understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you might believe, but believe that you might understand. Now, now, the next part of that verse there on your outline, you, stood, and you saw it there on the screen from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, where Paul says that we live or, or we walk by faith. Notice the next part of that verse. Let me find it in my Bible just really quick. I, I want to point out something else from this verse. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, uh, it, it says that we... Uh, we make it our goal, he says, the, the end of verse 9, to please him. Paul says that we are walking by faith, we are living by faith, not by sight, and our goal is to please him. Now, in my Bible, I circled that, please him, and I wrote Ephesians 5 and verse 10. Now, this isn't on your outline, but if you go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10, maybe just make a note of that. There the Bible says we need to find out what pleases God. 
So Paul says we walk by faith, we live by faith, and we make it our desire, we make it our goal to please him. And then Ephesians 5 says we have to find out what pleases God. And then in my Bible, I wrote down Colossians 1, verse 10. And when I go to Colossians chapter 1, and in verse 10 says that we pray this in order that you might live a life worthy of the Lord. And listen to this, that you might please him in every way. So the second thing on your outline, the next blank I want you to fill in is this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So when Habakkuk answered, when God's answer to Habakkuk was that the righteous, the just, the person who is living right is the person who is living by faith, Paul says that we make it our goal to live and to walk by faith, and we want to please him, we want to find out what pleases him, and in everything that we do, we want it to be something that is done to please God, it's essential to understand that, that it is impossible, a prerequisite to pleasing God is faith. So Hebrews 11, verse 6. So look at this on, here on the screen. It's on your outline. You probably know this verse. You may not have known this is right where it is, but you've heard this. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So the Bible just outright tells us, if our desire is to please God, that should be our desire. I mean, if we call ourselves children of God, it makes sense that a child wants to please his father, and we want to make it our goal to please him, we have to know what that is. And the Bible tells us that the prerequisite, that it is impossible to please God if we don't have faith, if we are not living by faith. Now, to understand this verse more fully, and Hebrews 11 is well worth the study, because Hebrews 11 not only tells us what faith is, and tells us that you need faith to please God, but it gives us this awesome example of all these people who lived by faith. And what we need to know is that here, faith is not just... When the Bible talks about living by faith, it's not just talking about living by a belief. It's not just talking about living by an understanding of who or what God is. Because that's essential that we do believe in God, because it says you have to believe in Him. But that we also understand that God rewards the one who is earnestly seeking Him. See, faith is this trust. Faith is this, this belief and, and this hope and this trust that no matter what's going on in my life, and when you, when you read what's happening during the time of Habakkuk, there's crazy things happening. And we know that today, there's crazy things happening, right? And here he is saying that this faith is a trust. It means that we continue to earnestly seek God, even when things around us don't make sense. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. This is what Habakkuk had to learn. In fact, look at this. Habakkuk chapter 3. Again, I didn't put this on the screen. But in Habakkuk, the end of chapter 3, Habakkuk made his two complaints before God. God gives his response and gives his answers. Habakkuk ends this book with this awesome praise. Listen to the end of the book. Habakkuk says in verse 17, Even if the fig tree doesn't bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, even if the oil, the olive crops fade, or fail rather, if the fields uh, do not produce any food, even if there are no sheep in the pen, even if there are no cattle in the stall. But, I mean, Habakkuk's basically saying, man, if everything in my life feels like it's falling apart, still, listen to what he says, yet, verse 18, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables me to go on to the highest heights. You know what the highest heights are? The highest heights are a height that's beyond anything we understand to be a height, right? When the world tells us this is, what, this is what it means to live, and this is how you know when you're successful, and, and, and God says, forget all that. The message that Habakkuk learned, the faith that Habakkuk lived by, was this faith that even if everything else is falling apart, I still trust in God's sovereignty, I still trust in God's power, I still trust in God's salvation, and that's what living by faith is all about. 
the band Mercy Me a couple years ago released a song that was entitled Even If. Let me share some of these verses because I think that the writer of this song maybe had some of the back in mind when he wrote these. The song says that they say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, I'm losing bad. It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down, but what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? He says, I know you're able, and I know you can, save through the fire with your mighty hand, but even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. Well, good thing a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength to be able to sing. It is well with my soul. He says, I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. I know the sorrow and I know the hurt would all go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. So it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. That's the kind of faith that it pleases God. That's why it's impossible without faith to please God. And that's what it means to live by faith. Let me give you one more. Number three, fill in these last blanks. We are saved by grace through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. The Bible says that our salvation is by God's grace, and it's by God's grace alone. I mean, it is only God's grace that he was willing to do what he did for us through Jesus on the cross. But that grace comes to us through our faith. And this has nothing to do with works, because works, the law can't save you. I mean, that's what Paul said, that, that text we looked at back in Galatians 3. Paul makes it clear that it's impossible for anyone to be justified by the law. But look what the Bible says, this next verse on your outline, Ephesians 2, 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, this is the gift of God. Now, now on your outline or, or in, on your Bible, what I would do with this verse, if I were you, I would circle that word grace, and I would circle that word faith. And then I would underline right there where it says the gift of God. See, the Bible teaches that God's grace to us is his gift to us. And a gift is something that is given because of someone's love for you. Not because of what you do, not because of who you are, not because of anything that you deserve or have earned. But it's a gift. That's what grace is. And salvation is a gift of God. And faith is a gift of God. That's why, especially... Especially in this time that we find ourselves. And especially I know that there are some of you, in addition to what we're all dealing with, that you have your own unique trials. You have your own unique struggles. You have your own unique problems that you're dealing with. And that's why it is so essential for us to live a life that is lived by faith. The gift of God that accepts the grace of God, which is the gift of God. That gives us the ultimate gift of salvation because of Jesus Christ and our faith in him. So let me share this final verse with you. It's here on the screen. It's on your outline. In Galatians 2.16, Paul sums this up by saying, But we know that God accepts only those who have faith in Jesus Christ. No one can please God by simply obeying the law. So we put our faith in Christ Jesus, and God accepts us because of our faith. Church, I want to encourage you to live by faith. 
a faith that trusts God even when you can't see what God has planned for you. A faith that trusts God when we don't know what may happen this next Sunday or the Sunday after that. A faith that trusts God regardless of who gets elected during this crazy political season that we find ourselves in. A, a, a faith that trusts in God even when it seems like the racial tensions in our country, some say it's unjust, some say it's not just enough, and there's this craziness that is taking place, and yet we are a people chosen by God who follow God and walk and live by faith, which is a trust in Him because that's who and what God accepts. And in your life, and in all that you're facing, I want to encourage you to the best way you know how. Say, Lord, today forward, let me walk by faith. Let me pray for you. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be a people who truly do what is right and what is just by our faith. By our hope and our complete trust in who you are and what you do for us. Lord, I do pray for peace in our nation. I pray for wisdom as we're just navigating this crazy time as a church family. And Lord, I know there are some who are watching and hearing this right now that just need to feel your peace, that need to experience and, and just know, just as you told Habakkuk, that you are in control. And I pray, Father, that we could live by our faith and that we would praise you for who you are, and we thank you for our salvation that is only through your grace that comes through our faith in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to do this, we ask in Jesus' name. And amen. The praise team is going to sing a song of invitation, and I do want to encourage you to uh, take some time, maybe while you're listening to this song, spend some time in prayer with God, ask Him to help you to live a life by faith, because it will change and transform your life if you do that. If there's something that we can pray for you, please leave a comment here on the video. I would love to just pray over anything that you would like to share with us, or if you send us an email, we'd sure love to pray with you and pray for you. I hope to see you Sunday, 9 o'clock at our outdoor worship. Until then, I hope you join us again next week online. May God bless you, and may God keep you.